So yes, I represent Privacy International and I've been uh, going backwards and forwards between London and Brussels for the last two years uh, to campaign in favour of the so-called data subject, otherwise people, in order to have stronger and more effective privacy rights. Now, I'm going to give you a little background on what's happening in Brussels and London and then we can continue the discussion after my colleagues have had their say. Um, so, uh, currently we have a Data Protection Act in the UK, uh, which is based on a European directive which was passed in 1995, and therefore it's very much out of date because the technology and the data mining and collection techniques have evolved tremendously uh, since then. Um, so nobody was happy with the status quo. Um, uh, consumers and, um, and people were thinking that uh, their rights were not being enforced effectively. Uh, they were not in control. Business wasn't happy either because uh, there were 27 different regimes in 27 different states and uh, they operate globally and internationally and they wanted some consistency. So the Commission set to work and since 2008 or 9 has been doing a lot of research and uh, uh, doing surveys of consumers and businesses and came up with a draft regulation in 2012 in January. Um, a regulation, probably the one, uh, those of you who know um, uh, the, the sort of terminology, Euro, uh, European terminology, know that a regulation, unlike a directive, is a much more prescriptive bit of legislation. In other words, once it's set, all the countries have to, um, uh, to implement it exactly as it is, as opposed to a directive which is... Uh, much more lax, you can take it as a basis and then do what you want on the national level. Okay, so uh, the first point I want to make is that this regulation, data protection, general data protection regulation, it's an evolution of the existing law. It is not a revolution as it is often uh, presented by various uh, businesses and authorities as well. Um, so what it's doing, um, it's taking the current principles that we have for data protection, and I assume this learned audience knows most of them, and takes them a little bit further by putting the consumer user more in control. Um, so the existing rights are still there, existing rights of access, correction of your data and deletion, uh, but they are strengthened. So basically the council has to agree with the parliament. Um, it is one of the most lobbied for and disputed pieces of legislation in the history of uh, the European uh, parliament and commission. Uh, currently it's being discussed in the uh, so-called LIBE committee, which is Civil Liberties and Justice Committee, and they are discussing no less than 4,000 amendments to, to this legislation, and therefore decisions are being delayed and the vote is being delayed because all the shadows from the various parties have to get together and negotiate and reach consensus, and consensus is very difficult to reach. So what are the main sticking points? I'll, I'll just give a few because I'm sure my colleagues will tell you a bit more. Um, key definitions, uh, the definition of data subject and personal data. Well, obviously, the wider is the definition, the more the law will cover. The narrower it is, the less the law would cover. So... Uh, Advocates like us are arguing for the widest possible definition to include IP addresses and unique identifying numbers online and so on, whereas um, others, particularly the big industries, are arguing for a much narrower definition. Uh, consent is another very big sticking point. 
Uh, this little word explicit is causing a lot of bother and there are hundreds of amendments that are deleting it and replacing it with unambiguous or lots of other words to make it possible to have it so that people don't know that they have given their consent, which is actually the situation now. Um, profiling is, is another big uh, point of dispute. Uh, the current draft regulation forbids automated profiling uh, without the knowledge of the data subject. Uh, automated profiling means that there are various sort of algorithms that makes, make a picture about you and you can be discriminated against and targeted against if you don't know that this is happening. That is a very big um, point of dispute. Uh, then there's the famous right to be forgotten, which is actually no more than a right to erase all your data from a, from a company, uh, plus a few other provisions like notifying uh, companies uh, that have the same data to delete it if they can. Um, then data protection by design and default also under dispute. Um, and then there are the administrative burdens, but I'll leave David to talk about them. Uh, thanks. Uh, 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 and Anna gave a, a, an excellent introduction to where we are in the process. I'll just add a, a, a couple of things. One is, is about the sort of timetable. Uh, the process, as Anna described, is going on at the moment. The Parliament and the Council are involved in Brussels. And the sort of key driving thing in the, the, the timescale is the term of office of both the Parliament and the Commission. They both come to an end uh, in the middle of next year, and that's when we'll have the next lot of European elections. So there is an, all this has to be sorted and agreed by sort of you know, March, April next year, or it falls and it has to start again. And there's no guarantee you know, that it would necessarily start again. So there's a pressure to get it all signed up and agreed by, by sort of March next year. And there's no absolute certainty that it will be agreed. Uh, I mean, you, I would suggest it's more likely than not that there will be an agreement and we will have a regulation. But I have to say, I wouldn't put a lot of money on that. And I'm not sure that's just about you know, political differences and the sort of things I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll hear on, 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 on this panel. It's that there is so much in this regulation and so many different areas to be considered. And everybody has an interest, because data processing, processing personal data, affects all areas of the economy, you know, law enforcement, uh, and so on. That just the task of getting an agreement on so many difficult issues is really quite a daunting one. There's a will to do it, but whether it, it will succeed is it, 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 far from certain. I mean, I'll just say a word or two about our approach as, uh, 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 as the regulator. Uh, and essentially, you know, data protection legislation is about protecting individuals, the rights of individuals to have access to their data uh, and some control over their data and to know that your information you know, is being handled properly by the, 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 the businesses that handle it. So our first aim in looking at any proposals is do they provide good protection to, 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 the, to the individual? Uh, but any protection does have to be proportionate. It does place burdens on businesses. And I don't think that there's any, you know, anything wrong in placing some additional burdens on businesses that they don't currently face under the existing uh, uh, regulatory regime, under the existing directive, uh, given that the benefits that businesses have gained over the last you know, 20 or 30 years since the last law was, was developed out of the use of technology and the use of person, people's personal information and the internet developments and so on that, that, that we're all talking about. So, yeah, the regulation needs to catch up and it will introduce such, such, some further burdens, but they do need to be, be sensible ones and proportionate ones. And once at the end of the day that, that I can say to, if, if this is a business audience, I could say, look, you know, you're required to do this because it helps protect people's privacy. 
Uh, I have to be able to justify why, why it's effective, not just say, well, you know, this is something that comes from Brussels, you have to do it, because that really uh, uh, isn't the way, way forward. So it is about not introducing red tape, it's about introducing a sensible regulation that really does uh, 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 protect people's privacy, privacy, privacy better. Uh, it's also, and I think particularly relevant here, it's about balancing of the right to, to privacy, data protection, with other rights. Because there are other rights that are impacted on by uh, data protection regulation, the right to freedom of expression uh, and open data. And indeed, yeah, we are seeing some moves to put something more recognition uh, 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 of open data and right of access in, 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 in the provisions. But at the end of the day, it also has to be realistic for us as the regulator to actually apply it and enforce it. Because again, if it's a law that can't be enforced, uh, essentially you know, it's in, it, 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 ineffective and doesn't ser serve a useful purpose. Uh, I just have to say as well that you know, we, we, ha we have a view here, uh, but we are not, as the regulator, part of the negotiating process. Uh, it's the Ministry of Justice in the UK who represent the UK government in the council. Uh, and we, of course, talk to the people in the Ministry of Justice and we give them our views and we tell them what we think will and won't work. And sometimes they listen and sometimes they don't. Uh, and there's the Parliament involved, and we have some discussions with members of the European Parliament. But again, we, we, you know, we don't sit in the Parliament. And we have a committee of our data protection authorities, like us around Europe, the Article 29 Working Party, who have views and opinions which also feed into the process, which are, but are not directly part of it. So we influence, but we don't have a direct say. And when we come to uh, what, what we like, what we think is good in the regulation, and you know, there is more that is, that is, that, that is good than, it is, than is bad in it. Uh, updating the rights of, of, of damage and distress so that if you suffer because of a, a, a breach of data protection provisions, you can get compensation not just for damage, for monetary loss, but for distress, which is much more relevant in the, 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 the circumstances we're, we're think, talking about. And this so-called right to be forgotten, which is a good thing, uh, up to a point. I mean, there are things in the right to be forgotten. The idea that uh, the burden of, 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 of proof is changed if you want to get your data deleted uh, is very important. At the moment, I can go to a, a, a business, I could go to Vodafone and say, I want you to delete my, my data. Uh, but I have to present to Vodafone what are termed pressing legitimate reasons as to why they should do so and demonstrate that it's causing me damage or distress that they, they, they hold my data. So I have to make, make, make the case. Because I'm sure Vodafone would agree, but uh, uh, the balance will be changed in the future, so that I go to Vodafone and I ask for them to delete my data, and they have to make the case as to why it's un they have a necessary business reason to continue to keep that data. And I think that's, that's very important. But some of the things around the right to be forgotten, just the term in many ways, implies you, you just have a right to go and have all your data deleted from the internet. And that really just is not a realistic right. And so some concerns that... that you know, this will be held out to individuals, that, that, that they have powers over their information, which in practice they don't actually have. But some powers, and some increased powers, to demand, yes, you know, Facebook take down your information, and so on, it, 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 it is very valid. Why do legal obligations, uh, those who process personal data but don't necessarily control it, uh, will have obligations to keep information secure? All the areas that, that Anna talked about, about data minimisation, uh, building in privacy by design, carrying out impact assessments are all in there, uh, and we like that. We like the t accountability of data controllers, that data controllers, organisations, businesses don't just have to comply with the, the rules that data should be accurate and kept secure. They have to be able to account for how they do that. So essentially, if we come knocking on the door and say, how are you complying with this regulation? They have to be able to demonstrate that they have systems in place, staff in place to deliver com compliance, and that it works I I in practice. So that's important. Uh, stronger supervision, stronger data protection authorities. Of course we like that. More powers to data protection authorities to, to, to impose fines, monetary penalties, and a power we have in the UK now, but not a lot of other data protection authorities do. Uh, and the idea 
which is the driving force behind the regulation, that there's greater consistency across Europe. That, yes, you know, if, if you move around from France to Germany and the UK, you have pretty much the same rights wherever you go, and businesses that operate across borders, as so many do, uh, you have the same obligations. Uh, I think we do have some reservations that that is taken a little bit too far. More consistency, uh, but not... Uh, Everything is exactly the same for every citizen in every corner of the European Union because there are different sensitivities uh, and different feelings and different views of privacy. I mean, if you take Google's Street View, not all the, the fuss that there's been about the collection of Wi-Fi data, just the basic Street View product. You know, there are uh, some countries where Street View is not uh, permitted on data protection grounds in Europe. Uh, I mean, we can have a debate about whether that is good or bad, but I don't think that reflects generally you know, the feelings of the UK population as a whole, that street view is such a sort of invasion of privacy that it shouldn't be allowed to happen. And I do think we need to be able to accommodate those, uh, those, those differences. And that's where we have concern. I think that in the interests of, of big business, multinational businesses, the Commission is driving too far in the rules being exactly the same. And I think that good protection for individuals means real rules that give you the protection you, 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 you want. So a bit less uh, uh, that. What do we, we, we dis dislike and have uh, uh, reservations over? Well, the regulation only applies to essentially commercial activity, the single market some public sector activity, but not to law enforcement activities, the activities of the police and the courts. There's another instrument, another directive proposed for that. And we don't like this fragmentation. There's even talk of further provisions, separate provisions or lesser provisions for the public sector. Uh, no, one set of comprehensive rules that apply across the board would be much better. There is too much detail uh, in the regulation, too much prescription of process where it says you know, every business must keep, and it lists all the documents that every business must keep. Every business must have a data protection officer with certain qualifications uh, 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 and so forth. We prefer the accountability, saying businesses, you're responsible. You decide, you need staff in place, but you decide what staff. You need documentation and procedures, but you decide. Uh, and we be accountable, and woe betide you if you get it wrong and you'll face sanctions. But you don't need to, to have spell out too much detail. Businesses still have to think or should have to think about what they need to do to comply and how to, to, to provide privacy protection. It shouldn't simply be going through a list of sort of tick boxes from the regulation. I've got a data protection officer and they've been appointed for two years, so that's all right. I've got this form and I've got that form, so that's all all right. Because that's, it's, a, it's about understanding privacy uh, 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 and, and delivering it. I mean, I, I, I've taken up my time, so I'll just mention two, 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 two other things. Uh, one that is a concern for us as the regulator is the workload potentially on data protection authorities and how we'll be funded. Not just because there'll be more duties on us, some checking and approval mechanisms which we don't have at, 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 at the moment, but this consistency mechanism, there'll be a European system for ensuring consistency which will, 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 will take resources. And there's a lot of discussion going on at the moment about the definitions, about personal data, and about introducing the concept of pseudonymization. Uh, I mean, I agree entirely with Anna. Personal data is very broad these days. You know, IP addresses are, are, are personal data. All sorts of things uh, are personal data. And the definition is broad at the moment. Some people are trying to narrow it, and that should be resisted. And there's also a move to introduce the concept of pseudonymization, uh, which is you know, uh, partially anonymized information, where the, the you know, names and addresses are removed, but you can still uh, 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 trace people, single, single them out, and lessen the protections that are available for that sort of, uh, uh, of data. Uh, there may be something in that, but I think, you know, we, firstly, it's extremely difficult uh, to come up with definitions and deliver them. And secondly, you know, is this a Trojan horse to uh, remove some of the protections that properly apply? Because things that are identified through IP addresses and the like on the internet and behavioural advertising you know, ought to come properly within the full scope of the, 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 the regulation. So I'll, I'll leave it there. That's a summary of, of, of our position. David, thank you very much.
In that event, we described the journey that my company had taken from the time that the privacy team was, was started about four years ago when I came on um, to now and the programs we had created and the things that we had learned in taking that journey. When we started the program, we undertook a little bit of a health check. We tried to identify where we were as a company, so we knew where we needed to move to as a company with, res with respect to privacy. And to find out what we knew as a company to be our, pr our critical risks related to privacy and, and how we needed to address them. And there was one area in particular that came out time and time again as something that was raising risk for us that we weren't addressing well, and that, that area was permissions and consents. And I, I, I don't want to give the, the impression that we were doing it wrong. We were fully in compliance. But the, the word that I kept hearing from, from our local markets over and over again was, this is spaghetti. This is a mess. We, we collect consents in a, in a very ad hoc sort of way. We, we build them on a case-by-case -case basis. And business leads ask the privacy teams, the, the, the lawyers most often, um, you know, whatever lawyer they had contact with sometimes, how do we do this? We ask a, they asked a limited question, and the lawyer gave them a limited answer, and the responses depended on who was being asked and their skill sets and their tenure with the company. And everything was siloed for an individual data use. We asked for an individual data consent with legal mechanisms that were narrowly designed. And nobody was really thinking about this on a more strategic basis. What did we want to do as a company with the consents that we were capturing, and how did we want those those permissions that we had to guide our business models and our approach as a company. Um, the fact that something so critical to our business, right, the, the consents that we have to operate, we're being treated in such a siloed manner, we're really kind of being ignored at the strategic level, that, that, was, that was clearly a problem. And I'm going to describe a little bit later what we did to, to, to change that approach, that siloed legalistic approach that I'm describing here. But, but first of all, I, I want to talk about the, the reaction at the event that we held. There was a really, really good question from MEP Ludford. She's the, the Liba rapporteur who's taken over for Alvaro while he's out. Um, she asked, you've had 15 years to get this right. What have you been doing all this time? Right? And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fabulous question because it underlines exactly what's happening in Brussels, the sense of frustration that policymakers and regulators are experiencing. That, that you know they've been stressing for a long time the need for a more innovative approach to privacy, something more consumer friendly, something where companies invest in in privacy enhancing technologies. They focus more on privacy by design. They create more effective internal governance mechanisms for privacy and data protection compliance, um, and and that they really need to be more transparent with customers about what's going on and better at conveying these these complex pieces of information about privacy. And, and that sense of frustration is really coming through every time we, we have one of these events, right? We've had this comprehensive legal framework in Europe for 15 years. So what's happened, right? Fully legitimate question, right? Everyone agrees that the Data Protection Directive is a tough framework. It's taken seriously by companies. Its fundamental principles are sound. So how is it that we've got so much process and so little privacy? Why is it that companies haven't really made significant investment in innovating? around these areas and in building these tools and capabilities that, that really help citizens achieve better privacy when they, when they deal with, with, with these companies. Um, so one of the drivers of that I, I, I want to point to is, um, you know, obviously regulation is playing a, a, a primary role here. The Data Protection Directive was a powerful piece of legislation and, you know, obviously my role and, and the roles of most of the people in companies wouldn't exist without it. I, this is the reason why I have a career, right? Um, but there's still little evidence that, that corporations are, are they're, you know, they're, they're creating an approach to privacy that's influenced by consumer insight or by research or by the competitive dynamic of the marketplace, right? We don't see companies treating privacy as a differentiator, right? Companies are treating privacy as a matter for legal compliance and legal compliance only, right? Because if regulation is the primary driver of privacy, then lawyers are going to be the primary players. And I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm beating up on lawyers here, right? I am a lawyer and I report upwards through several layers to the general counsel. But privacy is dominated by questions of law and policy within companies, and, and almost everywhere, right? I mean, how many of the panels today are talking about the laws that impact privacy and data protection? Um, 
it's dominated by the, the questions of interpretation of the meaning of rules and, and other disciplines are starting to, to, to kind of show through in this. We're seeing more of a discussion around behavioral economics, around sociology, around philosophy, around user experience and, and computer science and design. But really these, these, are, these are tiny little, uh, tiny, tiny little inroads to the vast mon monolithic edifice that is privacy and data protection law and compliance. There's relatively little focus on operational issues, on methodologies, on a technology solutions, on user experience. User experience is fundamental to privacy, but try talking to a data protection compliance lawyer about that. This shouldn't really come as a surprise, right? As long as privacy compliance is a matter for interpreting prescriptive rules, that's what lawyers do, right? And lawyers aren't computer science experts. They're not user experience experts. They're not technology experts. They're rarely any of these experts. So companies are creatures of economics, right? They'll, they'll go beyond the minimum that they're required to do if there's, if there's a financial upside, if there's a productivity gain, if there's a competitive advantage, if there's you know, a way to reduce costs, right? So the question goes to their lawyers. They, they you know, the business, they, they take the question, they go to their lawyers and they say, what's the minimum that I have to do to comply here? How, what's the minimum I have to do to stay out of trouble? And lawyers are trained to, to answer that question in a very technical way, right? They tackle legal problems by minimizing liability, by creating policies, by drafting contracts. They, they don't, they don't, they're not trained to address that question by enhancing customer experiences, by creating product strategy with operational governance or, or technology solutions. They, and they're also not the ones who are accountable for making decisions about companies' risks, right? They're advisors. They're not, they're, they're not running the business, right? And so when privacy decisions affect matters of brand value, of reputation, right, it's not necessarily the lawyers that are going to be making the, 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 the comprehensive, the holistic, the strategic decisions on that. They're asked a very narrow question, they're going to give a very narrow answer. Um, but I, there, I, I'm sure everybody here has installed the app on their phone, right? You get the pop-up, it says this app's going to use your location. It doesn't tell you why it's going to use your location. You don't necessarily have a choice about it. Sometimes if you say, no, you can't install the app or the app doesn't work, right? It's, it, 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 this is not a meaningful interface for anybody. It's even worse when you do things like um, you're asked to consent to the transfer of your data to a jurisdiction that may not have equivalent powers to the European Union, right? Is that a meaningful choice for anybody? If you say no, what, what happens, right? You don't get to use the app. You don't get to use the service. Consent just turns into this, 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 uh, it, it, it's a compliance regime, right? It's, it's the ability for companies to tick the box and say, we've done what we need to do to make sure that our data protection compliance is, is, is there, right? But it's not facilitating anybody's privacy. It's not leading to more privacy, and, and in a lot of cases, it's leading to less privacy because the overuse and the abuse of consent is leading to co customers who just tune out, right? They check the box because all they want to do is, is install the app and get started and, and you know, map their location and find out what tube is going to take them to their, their destination and you know, the kinds of things that we, we use our smartphones for. Um, I think this is a problem, right? And, and, I, and I think we would probably all agree that this is a problem. And it's not necessarily, you know, it sounds like I'm bashing lawyers, right? I'm not saying that the lawyers are the problem here. I'm, I'm saying what the problem is, is the creation of a, of a, of a regime that causes companies to disown the solutions. They're able to hand this off to their lawyers because that's what makes sense as a tactical and a technical response to <coughs> detailed and prescriptive rules that we have right now. It's a question of ownership and, and as you, you've heard a couple of people on the panel say now, it's, it's a question of accountability. Right? So data production regulation created this new legal discipline. This, it, it, it equipped a generation of lawyers to do what I do, right? to, to answer the, the narrow technical question, what I used to do. Don't do that anymore. Um, it hasn't done a very good job of encouraging companies to invest in other skills, the people and the management structures that we need to deliver strategic and holistic responses to privacy. So what I'm advocating for is a smarter approach. Right? The, 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 there's the saying, you know, insanity is doing the same thing all over again and expecting a different result. And we're seeing a little bit of that in, in the, the draft regulation right now. The proposal is still this prescriptive regime. In fact, it's even more prescriptive than before. But it's expecting that companies will respond to that prescriptive regime by creating better 
governance and better experiences. And uh, I just don't think we can expect that to happen. So, you know, I, I, I'm up here saying this because I think that, that my company's actually got a better approach to this. It's taken us a while. We've, we've, we started with a very prescriptive compliance mechanism and we've turned it into something that's more about internal governance and accountability and ownership of privacy as a strategic business imperative. So one of the first things we did is we, we, we repositioned it, right? We kind of took it out of the hands of the lawyers. We, we, we clawed it out of the hands of the lawyers in some cases. Um, we, we, we tried to internalize it, right? We tried to, you know, we have our, our nice little strap line. We tried to make it so that everybody at the company understands that this isn't just something that you do. You design your product and then you go to the lawyers and you ask for privacy policy. You ask for your contractual terms and that covers it off. So we've got an internal engagement program that's designed to make sure that everybody at the company understands that this is an obligation that they own. So we made it less about legal compliance. We've made it more about recognizing a deeper emotional component connected with trust and fairness and safety. Privacy is, privacy is becoming more about connected to sustainability, to brand value, to something inherent to the business. And I, I, I won't pretend that we've got all the answers here, right? This has been, a, a, in, in a lot of ways, an incredibly difficult journey to take the company on. And, and we've, we've run into a lot of blockers in, in some cases, you know, blockers from the lawyers of the company, shockingly enough. Um, but we have changed the approach over the last couple of years. So one of the ways we've done that is by making privacy sort of a tripartite structure. <coughs> the first part of that are our privacy commitments. That's, you know, we, when I came on, we had, I think, a, a 36 pages of group privacy policy. It was a legalistic <coughs> document that nobody in the company had ever actually read. Now we have seven commitments. We also have operational privacy, the privacy risk management system. That's making sure that everybody at the company knows what they have to do for compliance. Right? So things like vendor and supplier review and privacy impact assessments, the steps that operationally we need to take. And then privacy is a critical strategic matter, a, a finger in the wind, if, if you will, a, a way to assess where the company is, what are we doing as a company with respect to product development, um, where is our company going, where, where, is the, where is the industry going that's going to impact us in areas of strategic risk in privacy, um, where, what do our consumers think? What do, what do our regulators think are important things that we should be paying attention to? And then creating the strategic approach across the company that allows us to, uh, to address those risks. Uh, I'm, I'm going to point out one because I think for, the, for, this, for, this, um, for this audience it's a fairly important one, balance. We are occasionally called upon to balance the rights to privacy against other obligations necessary to a free and secure society. And we work to minimize the privacy impact when we're called upon to do that. And then at the end, accountability. Everybody at the company is accountable for living up to these standards, not just in what we do, but where we can. We work to influence the companies and the other uh, industry players that we, that we work with. Some of the ways operationally that we achieve this are through widespread use of privacy impact assessments. Now, the regulation includes a fairly narrow obligation to privacy impact assessments. It's a fairly formal process. But what we think is that privacy impact assessments, when they're when they're conducted on a very broad basis, are the key to getting business owners to understand the privacy impacts of the products they develop. And so we, we actually built this little automated tool that forces everybody who's going through the product development process fairly early in the process to understand through some key questions how privacy will affect um, the ways that they build their products and services. And, and in doing that, we achieve you know, the, the outcome of privacy by design that all of our policymakers are saying is, is, a, is a, a, a valid objective, right? And we've also tried to create other champions within the business for privacy by making it not just an obligation, but an opportunity. We talk about the ability to build privacy as a product, as something that we know our customers are interested in and will want the tools and the capabilities to be able to, to use to protect their own privacy. on both on the consumer side and on the, on the enterprise side. And so what we do is we build products that let customers feel safer and more secure and control their privacy on the networks that they're using and let enterprise customers do things like um, uh, something like Secure Device Manager, which 
allows the employees of companies to segregate their personal information from their business information on their phones in areas like bring your own device to work. Um, by creating privacy as an opportunity and not just an obligation, we create these champions within the business so it's not just the lawyers or the privacy experts coming in and talking about privacy, it's actually the business people conveying that sense of ownership back into the business. So I, I want to talk a little bit about what's driving us to, to rethink privacy. It's, it, it's not the regulatory environment, I can tell you that. The, you know, the, the increased data volumes, the consumer awareness and concern that's being spurred by, uh, in a lot of cases, by, by media focus and by organizations like, like the ORG, Privacy International, um, creating the, the environment where companies are forced to take this seriously because of the impact that this attention faces. That, the, 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 the attention that this, this has on their, on their brand and on their reputation. Um, there is still that disconnect between consumers' attitudes, you know, the, the responses that they give on privacy <coughs> surveys and their actions, right? So consumers say that privacy is very important, but, you know, is everybody <coughs> leaving Google in droves? Are they leaving Facebook in droves because of the, the drumbeat of publicity <coughs> about the privacy activities of these companies? Not, not really, right? We, we don't think that that means that, they, that customers don't care, but we do think that means that privacy is, is just one of the many considerations that, that customers go through in deciding whether to use products and services. New technology is making it easier than ever to find alternatives to these, solution, these services, though, and at the point where it becomes very easy to change, to move, to switch, customers will do that and companies will feel the impact. And then, of course, there's the economic opportunity. Um, Magdalena Kuneva talks about uh, personal data as the new oil of the internet and the currency of the digital world. Um, lots of controversies are arising because companies are realizing that there is great value in monetizing data, but they're not yet recognizing the central role that privacy plays in allowing that monetization to occur. Some companies have figured out that to unlock the value of the, of the data, to be able to engage in these new monetization <coughs> strategies, you need to put people in charge who understand the privacy impacts and understand the strategic impact of using data in these ways and are able to guide the company in making the right judgment calls and make decisions that ensure that, that these new products, these new, these new revenue streams don't, um, don't create the privacy controversies that we're seeing them create. So if regulation is necessary, I think we all agree that regulation is necessary, it's essential, but prescriptive regulation fails to create ownership, it doesn't create accountability, it doesn't create innovation, how do we do that? We use regulation as a stick for the momentum and offer the carrot for investment and innovation. You reward companies that invest in open accountability structures, internal governance, and public reporting of those internal governance structures. But then you reduce some of the, some of the more prescriptive rules, right? You, you, um, you don't require them to file the, the lengthy notifications that we, you know, in, in a lot of countries have to file. You reduce the paperwork. Uh, that, you, that you send to regulators. You reduce some of the legal formalities around things like data transfers. I, I'm not sure that we're really creating any, um, any, any better privacy mechanisms by requiring companies to do things like enter into to, uh, data protection uh, addenda to every contract when you're just doing things like uh, transferring data within an internal organization. Um, give companies options, give them the ability to create new industry codes of practice and regulatory covenants. Um, the, these processes have worked really well in areas like environmental law. Um, I think we can learn from uh, regulatory regimes like that. And then allow less direct regulatory supervision in exchange for accredited independent assessments and audits. Put the burden of, of the expense of ensuring enforcement on the place where it can best be best be carried, right? Not on, the, not on the public purse, but on the companies themselves. Re require us to pay for, for independent audits, right? Rather than expecting the regulators to bear the expense of that. Um, and, and once again, don't be afraid of ambiguity. In a framework with tough sanctions, it results in companies going above and beyond, right? So that they don't sail too close to the line and get smacked down by strong enforcement. And ultimately, the goal of regulation should be to give company executives, you know, not, not me, the data protection <coughs> compliance lawyer, right, but the company executives, the reason to turn to their lawyers and not just ask the narrow question, what's the minimum I have to do to avoid trouble, but ask the bigger question, how can we create better privacy outcomes for our customers? <laughs>